it doesn't occur to most people to worry about this, but philosophers are very concerned to understand how it is that we engage with objects in the world. We philosophers have always been interested in what's unique about human beings and how it is that humans engage with and make sense of the world around us. What, if anything, gives meaning to our lives? Most of us don't think about it. We just sit down in the chair and at the table and pick up the fork and the spoon and, and work with them. Philosophers are very interested in thinking, well, how can that happen? How is it that these minds up here somewhere in us manage to get out there into the world and grab a hold of these physical objects? I'm Ryan Cross, and I'm a bass player, cellist, composer. I started playing when I was uh, nine years old, started playing cello, and uh, started playing after my brothers. They all played classical instruments, and so I decided to go on and follow in their footsteps, but uh, then I took it a step farther after high school, I was picking up the bass, and then starting to figure out that uh, bass was a lot cooler than the cello. For me, connecting to my instrument, being connected to myself. I have to be connected here, so I have to be in touch with myself. Myself meaning the instrument becomes you, you know, so you're in touch with this. I started playing the instrument and it felt like it had a character of its own. The sound directed me where to go, and it felt like I was better because I was playing the instrument. So if you go all the way back to ancient Greece, to the fifth century BC, in Athens, you find one of the most important philosophers in the history of the West, namely Plato. And Plato was famous for articulating a story about what it is for anything to be anything at all, and in particular, what it is for us to be the kinds of beings that we are. What's important for Plato is truth, correctness, theoretical understanding. He was drunk on theory. It was so amazing to him. One of his big contributions to philosophy was the theory of forms, and that was the idea that we understand things and recognize things and, and can use things only to the extent that we have an idea of what they are. Plato thought things are as they really are when they're abstracted away from all of their particular details. And that's really been a dominant influence in philosophy. So philosophers have thought that we understand the world by getting clear about the way we think about the world. On the Platonic model, the most important and most interesting thing that we can do as human beings is to sit back and think rationally about the nature of the universe. That's a classical philosopher's account of what's special about us as human beings. We're rational beings, we're intellectual beings, we're thinking beings. Then comes another move. A long time later, around 1650, Rene Descartes, who was a mathematician and also very interested in science, Descartes said, and he meant this as a sort of definitive description of himself and other entities like him, is that I am a thinking thing. And a thinking thing is a mind which has in it ideas and in it experience 
and in it a representation, a kind of picture of the world. Especially since Descartes, philosophers have thought about us as subjects standing over against objects. And what you get is this incredible idea of what I call disengaged subject, right? That the subject of knowledge is not engaged in a, in a society. On the contrary, Descartes is asking people, each one to go back into their own mind and see how they can be certain of anything in the world, right? So disengaged from the society of of, as it were, fellow speakers, disengaged from the body, disengaged from tradition and history. Don't simply take anything on the fact that you've got it from your preceptors or you know, work it out for yourself. It's an incredible act of total disengagement. The really proper human mind knowing things is utterly outside of the society, the body, and any kind of tradition, right? Descartes was obsessed with the idea that we couldn't get off the ground if we couldn't find something certain to reason from. And naturally, the only thing he could be certain of is that he was a thinking thing, because he said even if he doubted it, that he was a thinking thing, he was thinking. So you can get started, and from there you can deduce everything. And every philosopher afterward, big deal philosophers like Kant, was working within that framework, and Spinoza, and Leibniz, and so forth. They all just took that for granted. And then a philosopher came along with a high powered enough to resist and overthrow the whole Plato Descartes tradition. And that was Heidegger. Martin Heidegger was a German philosopher. In 1927, he published a book called Being and Time, which was a, a landmark in 20th century philosophy, one of the most influential works in philosophy in the last 100 years, and, and maybe. Heidegger's idea was that the Platonic model has got the story completely backwards. That in fact, the most important thing that characterizes us isn't our ability to sit back and think rationally and logically about any entity or any set of situations in the world. The most important thing about us is our ability to become involved in worlds and to develop skills for acting in those worlds that at root are not intellectual skills, but very practical kinds of skills. Skillful coping is being able to do things with your hands, like painting or handwriting or woodworking. Oh, sports is another swell example that you learn how to do. But when you are asked how you do it, you can't actually say, well, I just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to hit the ball. How am I trying to hit the ball? I don't know, I'm just swinging the bat, but not, not swinging the bat, maybe somebody who's really good at it. So Heidegger is really confronting the entire tradition of Western philosophy, going back to the ancient Greeks. And um, from the earliest times, uh, philosophy was, uh, well, let me start over again, that was terrible. My name is Hiroshi Sakaguchi. I'm a carpenter. I do Japanese old house, the countryside, and also I make a, a new building too. If you think about a hammer in a, a philosophical way, or what people would call a commonsensical way, you'd look at the properties the hammer has, the shape it has, the color it has, and uh, Heidegger said, that's wrong. If you want to see what a hammer is, you don't think about the properties, you don't describe it, you don't uh, explain it, you pick it up and you start driving nails. And you really only see what the hammer is when you have the skills to hammer well. And, Without those, the hammer will never really show itself to you. The Japanese word for tool is dogu, translates into the way of carpentry. And that's a very sensitive description of what a tool is. The tool isn't an instrument that you focus on. The tool is literally a way the carpenter has of engaging with the world. 
So he's shaving, uh, shape money, you know, by two, you know, one play. I hold a sleep, <laughs> sleep together on my brain. <laughs> so <laughs> rough, you know. Your ability and your skill for hammering with a hammer, although when you acquire it, it might require a little bit of thought so that you don't bang your thumb every once in a while and that kind of thing. When you've got the skill as a real skilled carpenter, the last thing that you want is to be thinking about or rationally analyzing or stepping back from the activity that you're involved in. He's done it for so long, like he started apprenticing when he was 15, so, so it's so much his body, the way he moves, and it's, it's really like a martial art. It's very much a movement, like a dance. You want to allow the activity to go through your body, because your body has a certain kind of know-how for operating in this domain that thought about the domain will typically get in the way of. This most fundamental way of interacting with our world, other people in our world, uh, other objects or tools in our world, and so on, had been completely neglected for 2,500 years of Western, Western history because of the influence of Plato. I'm Leah Chase in Dookie Chase's restaurant in New Orleans, Louisiana. She is the grand dame of real cooking in New Orleans. She is the girl who has the nerve to chastise President Obama for putting a little hot sauce in his gumbo before he tastes it. Never did I think that I would be good enough to serve a president. When I came here, I knew nothing. I'd never been in the inside of a restaurant in my life at 18 years old, never. I went in this woman's restaurant. She taught me everything. But one thing I learned, to love that restaurant. I learned to love food. I learned to appreciate it. And I always said, this is what I want to do. She has 60 plus years of experience cooking. People think of recipes. She is the recipe. You know, when we're back there cooking, we never looking in cookbooks. It's just out the head. What we want to cook today, we want to cook tomato and basil soup. And I think we want to add some popcorn in the middle, and then you'll get the butter flavor of the popcorn. It's just amazing the different dishes that we come up or she comes up with just off the cuff. Tell me what the greens are that you put in it, because I have no idea. We put beef tops, we put turnip tops, we put mustard greens, we put kale, we put collard The great thing about being a philosopher is it's very hard to test what we say. You can say anything you want. We're usually dealing in such abstract, general things that you never have to prove it. The theories of the mind have been put to the test with the development of the computer. using computers, we were finally in a position to test thousands of years of philosophical theory about how the mind works. To a lot of people, it seemed like the computer finally offered us a chance to construct a mind using as our model all the philosophical theories we've developed. Bert Dreyfus's genius was recognizing that this was what was going on. The climate at the time was one of great with regard to the prospect of artificial intelligence. There were these people in the AI lab, artificial intelligence lab, claiming that they had found the rules and the symbolic representations that would soon enable computers to be intelligent. Bert was a junior faculty member at MIT in the humanities department, not the most prominent department at MIT. They were saying, look, we know how the mind works. You philosophers have missed it. He was going up against very prominent researchers at his own institution who were in the more prominent departments at MIT, the engineering and computer science kinds of departments. They were saying, well, we don't have to care about what Dreyfus says. He's just a philosopher. What programmers were doing was trying to make a computer intelligent by giving it the kind of thoughts that they thought humans had. So you make an exhaustive list of, there's a table in the room, the table is brown, the table is hard, the table is this size, and you, you can see that this could go on for a very, very long time. And it's got to do a lot with understanding what's relevant. What's relevant right now is that uh, I'm sitting here talking to you, and there's, the lights are relevant, cameras are relevant, 
if there's any dust on the floor under these, this chair, it's not. I mean, you just you can't take account of all the facts in this room. There's an infinite number of facts about this room. The systems would get hung up on metaphors or hung up on inferences that were dependent on knowledge of ordinary things in everyday life, like if you pick up this piece of weed here and drop it, it will fall. Right? And when it will fall, it won't make a sound because it's soft. Things like this that everybody knows. Uh, how much stuff like that do you know? Right? A hundred things? A thousand things? Maybe a million things? Right? And I think the hope was that, that once we got enough of those facts into the computer, that the computer would start acting like we do. If Heidegger was right and Bert Dreyfus was right, you couldn't do that. Bert really thought that the artificial intelligence community was basing their research program on a bad understanding of what it is to be the kinds of beings that we are. Philosophy had finally discovered that this rationalist, atomistic, rule-following understanding of how the mind works is wrong. They had the platonic idea that the kinds of beings that we are are rational computing mechanisms. We are logical uh, sort of characterizers of the universe. And they thought that they could therefore replicate all of the things that we do just by writing computer programs, which after all are very logical and very rational and follow rules very, very well. And moreover, sort of laughing at, at the philosophy classes who, where they say, look, you philosophers have been trying to understand perception and action and skill and all that for 2,000 years and you've got nowhere. We already have a very important clue and in another eight to 10 years, we'll, we'll have intelligent computers. I mean, there was a lot of derision of Bert and his work. Their name for me was the weasel, apparently. And Bert, pardon my putting it this way, it's kind of amusing looking character. Had brilliant orange hair and petite little guy sort of moved moved around you know like a i don't know an insect or something they said drivers doesn't know anything about programming i have the clue he, they're right about programming how can he be telling us that we can't do this in his view it was sort of the emperor had no clothes there was no support for this idea at all so he started trying to show how implausible it is once i was really brave they said we've got a car that will drive on the street in traffic from here to there with, with, with that because it has and with no human driver and i said i doubt it and they said we're telling you we've got it and I'm and I said I'm telling you that you haven't got it you're lying and they we and I was right I mean it was just that reality was on my side there, there was this huge effort to suppress this criticism because mainly because there were millions of dollars at stake DARPA gave the money for the research, defense research, and they were afraid they would stop giving the money. And then when I was at MIT, they were even more afraid because the AI lab got about a million dollars a year from DARPA for AI research. And they were afraid that if they ever uh, read my paper, they would take away their, their money. And in the end, that's sort of what happened. Ultimately, I think it's, it's fair to say that that, that criticism has, has won out. The claim was you could build such and such a machine. And you could test that claim by seeing whether you can build such and such a machine. And it couldn't be done in the 1950s or the 60s, and it hasn't been done even now. Perhaps I can reach to the uh, one of the most fundamental aspects about the difference between human beings and machines by adverting to something about each of us with which we are all deeply familiar, and that is that it matters to us what happens in the world. What matters, it matters to us what happens to us, it matters to us what happens to our friends, it matters to us the progress of science and philosophy. All of those are desiderata, those are things to build a life on that uh, one can summarize in the phrase, giving a damn. And if you have that phrase, then you can say, in a word, what AI has so far failed to come up with by saying the trouble with computers is that they don't give a damn. 
what we are at bottom, much more fundamental than our being thinking subjects, is that we care about something. Something matters to us. Entérate de una vez que yo nunca fui perfecto, ni lo soy, ni lo seré. Que el flamenco es un, una cultura de comunicación entre la gente, no es el escenario. El arte es la, es la mayor de las drogas. Porque como te enganches al arte, eso sí que no hay medicina que te lo quite. No. El flamenco no es la música clásica, pero el flamenco es de la calle. Y el flamenco no es mecánico. El flamenco es risa y llanto a la vez. Una forma de sentir forma de, de explicar lo que te pasa por mediación de la música. Ese camino del sacro monte me he encontrado unos ojos negros que el mejor de los pintores daría dinero por un verlo. Yo le canto a la vida y a los pájaros y a, a la naturaleza y a al amor y a la caricia y al beso. Si me pidieras la luna, no te la pudiera dar, porque la luna está presa en la alhambra de Granada. Ya hace tiempo que esclava de los besos. La guitarra, como cualquier instrumento, es una conversación entre dos, entre la guitarra y el guitarrista. The really important ends of human life are ends that are only perceptible if you let yourself be within the human situation totally. I mean, take love. What is it to have a really loving relationship? What is it to have real communion? What is it to have a really meaningful bit of music? You can go on and on. Nobody could lose touch with that aspect of being human entirely, but they always denatured it. So, of course, people were moved by music, people were moved by art, people were moved by love and so on. So they invented various ways of describing that. I mean, some kind of animal-type sympathy bonds people, so that can explain why love is important. And then they explain that certain kinds of emotions that we find pleasurable are, are, are awoken in us by listening to kind of music. So you get, incidentally, a very interesting shift where people talk about the validity of art in terms of this notion of aesthetics. In other words, in terms of our reaction, aesthesis is our sensation, rather than in terms of the profound truth that you can find in a great work of art, a profound truth about human beings. Moods don't happen without our heads. But that doesn't mean they happen in our heads. The analogy I like to use is a radio, right? A radio gets tuned into different radio stations. And as you turn the dial, you get different songs playing on the radio. That doesn't mean the stations are all inside the radio. It just means that without the radio getting tuned to them, you're not in a position to pick them up. The traditional philosophical way of understanding the world and, and thinking of kind of in, inside subjective uh, stuff, thoughts inside of us, and then facts, objects out in the world. One thing that that way of thinking about the world does is it makes all sorts of things inside of us. Like moods, emotions, right? Those are kind of subjective things that we project out on the world, onto things. So you want to say the world's not happy or sad, we're happy and sad, and we project our happiness out onto the world. When the, this phenomenological tradition uh, started to undercut the distinction between subjects and objects, what that did was uh, allowed us to, in a much more natural way, make room for moods, emotions uh, to be out in the world. When you talk of something like a joyful mood in the room, it's plainly not a creation of my mind or of your mind. What it is, if you like, is a creation of our interaction. Right? 
por la orilla de Chapina. Te di un besito en la cara y se iluminó Sevilla. And I think this matches our common sense way of talking about it. So uh, we talk about the mood in the room. There was a happy mood as we walked into the party, or the mood of the nation is downcast right now, or depressed as a nation. Now, I think that uh, that's capturing something real about our experience of the world and the way that the world isn't just these sort of neutral facts, but that um, it, it lines up in particular ways. Um, it, it's illuminated in particular ways, and when we get in the right mood, it's a way of getting in tune with the world so that it can show certain features to us. So when you're happy, the world looks different. And it's not just that you're interpreting the world through a different filter, but it's that your happiness tunes you into features of the world that you weren't paying attention to. Just as skills allow things to show themselves, they also allow people to show up and be the people that they are. As a craftsperson, uh, as they learn how to work with wood, how to hammer, how to use the equipment, they'll start to see things that someone without those skills doesn't see. They become someone who inhabits a world differently. Can you describe the process of choosing the piece of wood? How do you tell if it's the right piece of wood or the wrong piece of wood? The same human being, personality. You can see the color. Some are horrible personality. That kind of wood you can use. Twist, <laughs> some stores sell that kind of wood. <laughs> same price. You work on all the time, you know. You color different, grain, tight grain, loose grain, you know, big grain. Oh, heavy wood, very beautiful yellow color, dark brown color, unbelievable. If you come very good, nice wood of your girl, you can find a good wood. Couple of days, not fun. It's not fun. <laughs> bodies, our ways of being, get attuned to the world. And, and there's a kind of understanding there that we can't explain. Uh, we're, we're, we're very poor at articulating. Rules work by ignoring details. What anyone who's very skilled in a domain knows is that being very skilled means responding not just in general terms to the situation, but responding very specifically to what the situation demands. So a chef working in the kitchen can't go by the rules in the cookbook. Let me tell you about rules in cooking. You know, I had a book written by a woman, and she put the recipes in the book that her housekeeper, or at that time, was the mammy of the house, you know, but she was the lady who ran the house. So naturally, all her friends, when the lady wrote the cookbook somewhere about 1910 or something, they asked her, well, why do you give her all your recipes and all your things? So her answer and was a good one. She said, you know, cooking is like religion. Rules don't no more make a cook than sermons make a saint. So you can have all the recipes, all the rules you want, and you, you can take the same things I'm doing here, and maybe you can't do the same things I do. Risk is absolutely important in becoming a master, in fact, in acquiring any skills at all, because you have to leave the rules behind and stop doing what one generally does and doing the standard thing, and you push out into your own experience of the world you have to take risks. You have to do something that the rules don't tell you to do so that you can start to learn to get tuned into the particular features of the situation.
What are the uh, most important things to master? Learning to read ocean conditions, knowing your boat practice experience, and uh, I guess there's an element of luck, and then probably have some balls too. <laughs> Just the human element in controlling one of these boats when they take off, they won't do this. They'll 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 climb this way like a plane. And the next thing you know, you are going swimming. The question then arises whether the people who are running speedboat races are bringing out something important about the boat or about the water that they are sensitive to and nobody has ever been responsive to before, or whether they, the, the water and the boats are just means to achieve some particular goal like being the fastest boat. It may be that some of them are doing one and some of them are doing another and some of them are doing both. So the willingness to take risks is a very important stage in moving beyond just competence in following the rules and doing what everyone else does to getting into the position where uh, you learn what you're supposed to be responding to. What distinguishes the kind of risks we're interested in from just uh, bravado is whether the risks are done, taken in the interest of what somebody is committed to, what they've defined themselves in terms of, and what makes the meaningful differences in their lives. That kind of risk is a special kind of risk that is a necessary part of becoming a master in anything. Heidegger calls this fairly dramatically, running forward into death. <laughs> and what that means, I think, is being willing to embrace a particular kind of possibility and let other possibilities die off. Risks of looking ridiculous, for example. Uh, risks of uh, genuinely losing things you might regret losing later on. Taking risks is important. It's, it's an essential part of jazz. Improvisation is supposed to be the element of freedom, venturing into space that hasn't been seen before. You're supposed to always be trying something new. Instead of playing patterns or just playing something that everybody's heard before. Sometimes I'm surprised myself. Sometimes I'll listen back to something I played and be like, oh man, did I play that? In a good way, you know. And then other times I'm like, oh man, did I play that? <laughs> Why do you do the things you do? I like what I do, but I've learned I don't care how old you are. You take a risk. You do what you have to do and keep going. In addition to the fact that you can't ever get beyond a rule-governed behavior without taking risks, there's also a kind of exhilaration or joy in human existence, leaving the rules behind, going out on the edge, letting the world show something new to them. The risk takers are the ones who disclose new worlds, disclose new ways to be human, new ways to behave, uh, discover new things about the world. So I studied this man. He teach me and how to sharpen it. But he don't teach it though. <laughs> and uh, I look he, what he does. So I, I saw and how to do it many times. Your teacher, you don't teach you anything. Sometimes clean up on the, <laughs> on the floor a couple of years. <laughs> teacher said, clean up on the, in the sawdust. So I go there, clean up sawdust. <laughs> you commit yourself, and it's through your commitment that all of a sudden the world is organized in terms of things that are meaningful to do and things that are irrelevant to do. I don't stop. You know, just the money to quickly to make a job done. I'm not. I just, I like to do so. <laughs> Sometimes I rather lose money. I estimate overbuying material. <laughs> Sometimes I'm <wife> very angry. <laughs> what happens when you have this commitment to a particular something that's uh, finite and that you could lose and that's risky and you hold yourself open to it completely what happens in that situation is that you get a sort of meaningful existence and the meaningful existence is the one that identifies who you are it's your meaningful existence it's the one that 
picks you out as an individual because nobody else understands the particular hierarchy of meaningful differences the way you do. The issue is, what is it to be the kind of being that we are? And, and you want to explore that issue by asking, what is it to be the best version of us? When we're operating at our best, we're precisely not uh, detached from the situation that we're involved in. Rather, we've opened ourselves up to being called to act in a certain way in the situation. So you find examples of this all over the place. I, I read recently um, a book by John McPhee called A Sense of Where You Are, which is a book about Bill Bradley, who was an extraordinary college basketball player and went on to be a, a great basketball player in the NBA. He says the most amazing thing about Bradley when he's taking the ball down the court is his vision. He says he doesn't seem to be looking at anything. Rather, he's a glaze of panoptic attention. <laughs> he has this, there's a kind of glaze, he's not focused on anything, but he's ready to be drawn into whatever it is that's calling him to act at the moment. Authenticity means owning up to the situation you're in, confronting the situation, and doing just what needs to be done. It's a responsiveness to the unique particular situation you're in. When you're authentic, you're resolute. You're confronting the situation you're in as this particular situation, not just as an example of a kind of situation. I call it the teenage boy phenomenon. <laughs> the, you know, the, when, when, when boys often are trying to figure out how they ought to act and what it's cool to do and what it's uncool to do in particular situations. You often find some of them who do what they're sure one ought to do in a particular situation, and they do it because they're sure they ought to do it, and it's always a disaster. When kids are coming up and they're learning to play in schools and they're in that sort of formal environment where they're in front of a teacher playing music, you know, they have to, they're forced to bring something to the table and they're told to get better and better. You know, you're not playing well, you need to play better today. What's lacking is like listening to everyone else in the room and sort of understanding that I don't have to rely on just everything that I know. If I listen to the other guys at the moment, I can come up with new things on the spot. That's when I'm really like in tune with it or in touch or channeling, if you want to say. So the authentic person is the one who will confront this concrete situation, who will do what needs to be done, who's responsive to it, attuned to it, and who, who therefore has a certain kind of spontaneity that you don't get if you insist on falling back on rules, principles, procedures, generic um, formulas for how to act and what to think and what to say and how to be. When I was only playing classical, I would just read what was on the page, learn it and memorize it and play it. With jazz, when I'm in that zone, I'm not even thinking about what am I playing or what note. It's just what's going on at the moment with the other musicians, and this is what I'm bringing out. It's really hard to describe. It's a very common quality for people that are learning how to play jazz to be very introverted with their music. And when you're practicing every day, it's something that you do by yourself. You, know, you, you open up your, your practice book and you read your, your notes or whatever, or you, you, you practice your rudiments on the drums and stuff like that, and these are things that you're doing all by yourself. And so when you get to a performance setting where you're around other musicians, there's a huge tendency to sort of get in your head and to just go back to what you're used to doing every day, six hours a day, is just playing by yourself and not really listening for the ways to react to what's going on outwards. And as you grow older and as you get more experience and as you learn to master your instrument, master music making, uh, you learn to, to include the other musicians and then even further include the audience and also include the nuances and the, and the different sort of aspects that are around the room and, and bring that in and use that to help you create the music that, that you're creating for because you're always creating music for somebody. 
Actors actually have this wonderful expression, it's very Heideggerian, though I don't think they know it, which is that when you're on stage and you're acting, you have to, as they say, you have to own it. That's a beautiful way of describing, you know, going for it and really putting yourself into it uh, and not wanting to step back and distance yourself from what you're up to. It's very tempting to want to sort of keep the back door open so that you can, you can step out of your actions and disavow them or rethink them or play the scene all over again and so on. But if you're on stage and acting, you can tell when an actor is, is um, reticent in that way. In these kinds of situations, they experience themselves as having the action drawn out of them. And you'll find it in sporting events. I'm sure that you'll find it in, uh, in music. You'll find it in any domain where op operating in the domain requires a sophisticated kind of skill and requires a kind of openness to what's going on at the moment. And that goes also for the domain of living a life. This is something weird about this tea. I don't know why, but it doesn't pour. So let's not worry about it. No, no, keep, go ahead. Well. It's pouring. It's just pouring slowly. Very slowly. I'm going to give it artificial respiration. I never did this before. See if that saves it. Aha! Uh -huh. I could become a tea doctor. There's a real tension in societies between uh, con conformism and uh, individualism. In order for society to function, there has to be a considerable amount of regularity in human behavior. There is what Heidegger calls the one, which is his name for the social norms. That is, you do what one does. You drive on the right-hand side of the street, you wear clothes, you stand the distance that one is supposed to stand in your culture when you talk to people and so forth. There is a sense that mindless conformism is dehumanizing and destroys what's great about us and, and unique about us. So uh, we value uh, individuality as well. But you know, there's a tension there. If everybody's an individual, then you lose the benefits that come from shared adherence to rules and shared norms and, and values. So there's always a tension going on there. So if you did something that was really totally radically new and had no continuity with the traditions of the, of the culture you're in, it would be unintelligible. And it wouldn't just be unintelligible to your friends, uh, it would be unintelligible to you. If you sort of throw off all your clothes and roll in the flowers at lunchtime when everybody else is, is eating their sauerkraut and wurst or something, that's, that isn't it, no. There's a certain romantic conception, which is that you just burst out of all conventional constraints, all norms and received opinions, and you just become your own person. We're thoroughly conditioned by the world we're in, and that world is a world of customs, traditions, practices that we're just so immersed in we can never see our way out of it. So the only way to do anything skillfully and with innovation and insight and sensitivity and authentically is to be appropriating traditions, practices, customs that are all around us in the world uh, that we've just absorbed. When the, the South American teams about two years ago realized that um, they could they could gain some space over the Germans by pulling the ball back to right on the onto the sideline, right? They'd pull it back to the sideline, and the Germans were afraid. They were, the Germans really respect the rules and the boundaries. They wouldn't come in, so it gave them a little room, right? So they used the superior skill that they had to really manipulate the lines. It gave them space, and they started beating the German teams again. Uh, the example of an athlete, I think, is a good illustration of this. Athletes are rule bound, rule governed. You can't play the game unless you're you're following the rules, but the great athletes see a way to express something about the game within the confines of the rules, but in a way that other people hadn't thought to do or aren't able to do. A real innovator changes the way the game is played, and the game takes on a new style, and people start playing it differently even though they're following the same rules. There's the famous example, the Fosbury flop. He jumps with his back to the thing he's jumping over. Everybody else went sort of dived over, and everybody thought it was crazy, but he won gold medals at the Olympics. The same rules are governing the game, but now the game has a whole new look. There's a way of doing things that's altogether new.
Heidegger had to work out a new notion of world because it was clear that, that it's not the ideas in another realm that Plato was thinking about, and it's not the sum total of objects, which is what Descartes was thinking about. Well, then what is it? What is it to be open to the world, the, kind of the way we are? What sort of is, what is it that we're open to when we're open to the world? What is it to have a world at all? There are all possible, lots of worlds. There's the world of jazz, the world of carpentry, the, the, the world of cooking, the, the, there are sports worlds, and then uh, there's our world, that ours meaning the academic world. Heidegger thought that the, our highest dignity as human beings, what really set us apart from everything else in the universe was our capacity to disclose whole new worlds, to open up whole new possibilities. Heidegger coined this idea of disclosure to capture something that we're not used to thinking about, and, and that is the way that things only show themselves when all the conditions of skill and all the relationships between them are possible. And then the experience there is of something opening up, a space of possibilities opening up, a, a way of inhabiting the world opening up. And it's not like it was there all along. It's not like the world of jazz music was somewhere there in the Middle Ages, say, or in the Greek world, just waiting to be discovered. It was something that had to have a space provided for it. He said, que no quiero verla, que no quiero verla. Porque voy a tener que matarla y no tengo valor para perderla. These worlds, these coherent, whole, organized ways of being humans in activities at objects in the world, all of that requires something to open it up. A ver a mi novia vengo a decirle que la quiero porque esta noche yo tengo mi corazón prisionero y sus ojitos relucen como dos candelas su pelo es tan fino como el terciopelo. Mi novia se llama del hombre Manuela y en cambio la tuya se llama con su Ay, gracias. ¿Dónde estoy? Heidegger especially in the last few decades of his life, became obsessed with what he called the hidden history of the West. It wasn't the sort of history that historians usually talk about, uh, things happening, battles being fought. Instead, it was the history of changes in worlds. Heidegger saw that there were epochs in what he called the history of being, in which there were whole, not a whole different style of of coping and, and a whole different style of everything. Everything is. We don't usually think about what isness means, but in his view, the history of being is a, is a series of three to five different, fundamentally different ways of conceiving of isness. And because, you know, it's not like people walk around thinking isness is this or it's that. It's just they're socialized into it. They, they grow up th learning to deal with things through practices in different ways. There was this early Greek epoch, and that was an epoch in which the name for being was physis, and it means nature. They had a sense that to be was to sort of emerge, to open up or blossom or dawn into the light, into the opening, and then to sort of wither away and to fade away. Things were whooshing up, 
lingering a while and then going away. Important things. Emotions well up and linger and go away. Moods well up and go away. Great athletic performances do that. And that's exactly what you lose a sense of if you think that to be is just to be an object of knowledge. Then what happened after that? The current understanding of being in Greek was poesis, and poesis means bringing things out. But this is like growing crops. This is nurturing. It was what craftsmen do. So like Hiroshi, they were helping the grain in the wood come out and show itself at its best. And of course, cooks do the same thing. They bring out what's best in the food, and they bring out what's best in the people eating the food, and they bring them all together. Something of poesis is still left from that epoch, and it's kind of marginal for us now. I mean, the big banquets were the central thing for the Homeric Greeks, and the craftsmen were the central thing for the poesis uh, epoch. But, uh, but we still have a sense of that, and uh, just as we still have a sense of things whooshing up, the uh, moods for particularly. Uh, now, then what's the next one is very interestingly different than poesis. Instead of bringing out what's in things, the Roman understanding of being was to impose form on matter. And instead of bringing things out, you hammered it into shape. You imposed an order on everything. Their favorite thing, I would imagine, would be bricks. You just got this mud. You can't bring out the form in the mud by poesis. You just make the mud into bricks. You make the bricks into roads. You make the roads into bridges. And you minister the whole Roman Empire. You kept down the crowd, as Virgil says the great person does. Then that sets up the Christian one. And finally, there's only one big producer, God. He imposes all the forms on everything. Everything has its proper place in a hierarchy, and everybody knows what to do because they've got that place. The king does what kings do, and the bishops do what bishops do, and nobody has to ever worry about whether they should be a soldier or a peasant or a bishop because that's all settled for them in their given tradition and their family and their location in the, in the scheme of things. What are all things then? Well, we have a word for it. We just don't notice it. They're all creatures. Creatures created by this supreme being. And they thought that all the things were ordered by how close they would approach to God's nature. They had a notion in the Christian world of what they called noble metals, things like gold and, and silver. These were noble because the Christians thought they were more like God. They were incorruptible. They went rust. And so when you looked at gold, you thought that gold is much closer to God than just an ordinary rock. And, and it was all organized around God as, as the highest and, and greatest thing in the universe. It's a very closed world. If, as Heidegger thinks, human beings are there to open worlds, this is about as far from where we should be as we can get. The way Heidegger understood it, the modern age lasted from roughly the 16th century to the 20th century. The modern subject has taken the place of God. It's us who give everything its meaning. What humans in the modern age were all about was dominance, dominating the world, subjecting it to their will. And so if you think about the great heroes of the last several hundred years, they were explorers and conquerors, bravely encountering new situations, or scientists who cracked the code and figured out how to manipulate things and use things, or cowboys who had this sort of deep inner will and they could go out and break down any obstacles in the path to achieving what they desired. Now we're in something entirely new, what he calls the technological understanding of being. Heidegger wants to use the word technology to talk about uh, our uniquely contemporary way of experiencing the world. Everything is interconnected, everything is exchangeable, and all meaningful distinctions have been gotten rid of, except this one sort of empty distinction, to be efficient and optimized. And you see it all over the place. We're so used to it that we don't even notice it. That's what great philosophers are supposed to do, is help us see what, what's going on in our understanding of being. Efficiency demands a kind of standardization. And you have a few ways that you become very, very good at, and then you repeat them over and over and over and over and over again. 
you have these sort of frightening subdivisions that you see as you drive in from the airport usually, where all the houses on the side of the hill are the same shape, the same color. They just discovered that's the most efficient way to build a house, and they just build them all that way, and everybody manages to live that way, and so everything is totally standardized. Everything is just resources to be optimized. The most efficient way to feed people is to have a few ways of doing it, and then you impose it everywhere. The most efficient way to make a broad range of goods available to everybody is to do it on a big scale, like Walmart does, and, right, and make everyone indistinguishable and have everything organized and efficiently laid out. It's just to get the world as organized as possible and to bring more and more into this total organization. It's really systems thinking. Everything is a system. The airplane is no longer an object when it's sitting on the runway. It's a cog in the transportation system. And you might think, well, at least you're going to be there to either take the plane or not take the plane. But no, the tourist industry has been set up for, to make you a filler of this potentiality for running around that's on the runway. And why will people go just to get a rest and get more energetic so that they can plunge back into the rat race, in which they're all replaceable. They're just doing some job efficiently, and if somebody comes along and does it more efficiently, they can be replaced. One of the dangers of technology is it re relieves us of the burden of having to develop skills. Technology is always sold as a labor-saving device. When you buy the latest technology for cooking, the promise is that you can cook as well as a master without any of the skills the, the master has. And, and that goes for everything with music as well. So all of us now today can enjoy music of a quality unimaginable to most people in the history of the world in the comfort of our homes with very little cost and very little effort. That's a great promise. And who, who, would, who would give up on that, that pleasure of hearing music in that way? But the danger is that we give in to the seductions of technology to the degree that we lose all of these skills. The internet is actually a much better example because what the internet is doing is it's basically transforming all reality into information. Everything on the internet is equal. You can have the most important information right next door to the most trivial. You can find out uh, on Twitter where, what your friends had for breakfast, and you can find out also that there were 100 people killed in Iraq that day with Google and find anything, and you can go in Wikipedia and get any facts about anything. And that, in a certain way, is terrific. If you, but if, if you just use it for something relevant, but if you think that that's just the best thing in the world, just to have more and more information, more and more transformable stuff, more and more applications for your iPhone that make it able to do more and more things, and that that's just what it's all about, everything gets leveled. There's no meaningful differences anymore between what's important and not important, what's trivial and what's uh, uh, crucial, what's uh, relevant and irrelevant. It's all reduced just to more information. If you want to really be efficient, you don't want this kind of uh, you know, interference that, hey, this is Sunday or this is uh, Christmas, so that means that you have to stop that. Or this is the middle of the night, what do you think you're doing? No, 24-7 is the, one of the great great achievements of our civilization. Things, some things go on all the time, are available all the time, and it's very handy. You know, three o'clock in the morning, I rush to my computer and I can Google, and nobody's gonna say to me on the screen, this is not available, this page is not available because you're supposed to be sleeping. No, <laughs> they're, gonna, right, they're gonna give it to me. So it's absolutely great, I benefit from it myself, but you can see what this is doing. What is it doing is making us look at time as something that is infinitely uh, usable and extensible. Doesn't matter when it is, I can access. Right? As against being, as it were, forced back into understanding that there are times that are just different, that have a different quality. It's not a, appropriate to use them in this way. And it's true that it changes us. So we have to become the kind of people who are satisfied with 
the sort of commodities that are delivered to us. You could imagine people who really are connoisseurs of jazz music, who really understand that one of the great things about jazz music is the way the mu musicians are responding to the performance hall and the audience and the particular musicians that are there and, and, and the weather and, and whatever accidents are happening. Uh, the jazz musicians are, are incorporating it into their performance. Responding to the other musicians is one of the most important things. And playing together, you'll hear that in the music, where the piano will play something, the bass will react, and the drums are playing, and then the trumpet will jump in. You are interacting with everything. Everything is a part of what you're trying to get to. Anything can change what's happening. The cell phone goes off, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, the cat might make fun of it on the piano or even on the trumpet or whatever it is, and it all becomes a part of the performance. And if you as a listener are a skillful listener and have the, the bodily dispositions to pick up on that, you'd never be satisfied by listening to a recorded jazz performance on CD because that's not the performance that would be optimal for your bedroom or, or living room. But technology makes us also the sort of flexible people who uh, are satisfied with a sort of cheap imitation of all the goods that, that uh, deeply skillful practices deliver. Somos artistas demostradores, somos artistas de sello propio, y somos artistas de sentimiento, y somos artistas de creadores de nuestros trascendencia. I've heard that flamenco artists have a deep aversion to even being recorded for this very reason, that they, they have just an intuitive sense that recording them and making their performance reproducible in all sorts of foreign contexts is, is uh, distorting what flamenco is really all about. Ayer me preguntaste una cosa, me dijiste, ¿qué es el compás? Y yo te dije que el compás era una medida. Y no estoy de acuerdo con eso. El compás es una forma de andar. Una forma de hablar. Una forma de besar. Una forma de abrazar. Eso es el compás. Technology is something to be grateful for. We have to learn how to not be seduced by technology, to keep this, this drive alive, this desire alive, to be humans. In his last years, Heidegger was trying to figure out how to resist the technological understanding of being and, find, and have a meaningful human life in spite of it. We're speaking to a malaise that a lot of people feel, but they may feel, well, I feel this malaise, but I mean, I have no right to because this is progress, right? This is civilization, or this is modernity, or this is, you know. Uh, we, we've made this tremendous leap ahead from all those benighted peasants in the Middle Ages, so who am I to complain? This sense of being, of being sort of morally compelled not to protest, which a lot of people have alongside the feeling that something's wrong here, but I can't believe the feeling because reason tells me the contrary, we can explode that uh, myth. The problem is how to respect technology, appreciate technology, use it to get rid of all the dumb stuff that we used to have to do, and yet not let it get rid of what matters and what is local and what is unique and what is significant and meaningful for us. If I think nature around me is nothing but meaningless stuff waiting to be optimized, then why shouldn't I just put a nice big hotel here, make a lot of money, all the people can see the ocean? The idea that there's something there independently of me is something you have to cultivate and develop a sensitivity to. And I think that's what a poet does. The poet is sort of the paradigmatic instance of the person who's learned a receptivity to things independent of us.
we can all learn that. You don't have to be a poet or an artist, you know. You can be a, a cook or a carpenter or a soccer player. Life is made most meaningful when you respond to meanings that are independent of you, right? I mean, this is a point that goes back to Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard said that if you think all meaning comes from you, then you can just take it back. You're a king without a castle, right? You'll, you're, a, you're a sovereign of a land of nothing. There has to be something in the world that pushes back, that has some force over you, or else you'll never experience anything as really mattering to you. ¿Y por qué las guitarras que no son artesanales son tan malas? Porque las hace una máquina y la máquina no siente. La máquina no entiende. Entonces, las guitarras están vivas siempre, la madera está viva siempre. Y no es lo mismo. Eh, una cómoda, ya no vamos a hablar de, de una guitarra, vamos a hablar de una cómoda, de un aparador, de una mesa. Cuando la hace la mano del hombre, la, la comida en esa mesa sabe de otra manera. En un plato que lo haya hecho una máquina. Sí. ¿eh? A comer en un plato que está hecho de barro, que viene de la tierra, y que los haya mm, tocado la mano, la mano humana. ¿Por qué? Porque hay dedicación a las cosas. Las cosas se diferencian, la máquina se diferencia del hombre, precisamente en que el hombre no es una máquina. The standardization that's required for efficiency rules out those sorts of practices. And, and, and what characterizes all of them is that they're not terribly efficient. They're, they um, require a real sensitivity and receptivity to what the particular world requires. Japanese carpentry doesn't have the focus on efficiency. It's the quality that's really important and the feeling. And so some projects, for instance, Hiroshi did this project that took seven years. After he selected the wood, it took two years for the wood to dry. And then it took 18 months for him to cut everything out in his shop. You have to be patient if you want a Japanese structure. The way in which Michelangelo saw David in the marble, there was like the inchoate possibility of David, and he brought it out. For me, that's, the, uh, that's what we all have to do in our lives, in whatever way. You know? And it's a little mysterious to talk about it like that, but I think anybody who gets really good at things has some sense for what it means to bring out what's there that nobody's seen. For me, it was sports when I was younger, now it's teaching, right? So, and that means interpreting texts. So I get incredible um, joy out of showing that a text that's been read for 2,000 years, there's things there that nobody's ever seen that are really there. And that once we you know, articulate them together, we can all see that they're really there, right? That the great texts are inexhaustible in the same way that reality itself is inexhaustible. I think that's the lesson, that there's this kind of mysterious source that continues to offer humanity meaning. You can call it God if you're religious. It's religious in the literal sense of religia, everything's interconnected. A focal practice reverses all the bad things we talked about. It draws a group of people together around some specific thing that matters, that requires a kind of skill and mastery in order to be done, and which brings the people out in their own uniqueness at their best. I tell my students, you can't buy the meaning of life, you can't borrow it, and you can't manufacture it, you can only discover it. And then I invi invite them to uh, search their experiences and their hopes and aspirations for occasions where they are in a position to affirm four propositions. The first is, there's no place I would rather be. The second is, there's no one I'd rather be with. The third is, there's nothing I'd rather be doing. And the fourth is, this I will remember well. There are moments when I'm juggling, and they're my favorite moments, when I just get lost in what I'm doing. And when it happens to me on stage, I get to share that moment with my audience. I will juggle in a crowded bar, and I know it's working when people go silent, and everyone stops, and everyone looks, because they can't help it. And those are magic. Those are magic moments, and that's why I do it. With jazz, you know, you're able to interact with the stars of jazz. Somebody like Wynton Marsalis or Branford or Ray Brown, which was my teacher, you could just go up to him and say, hey, it's a community. And that community is what really uh, drew me to jazz music. There's those times when you'll get too inside and those jazz masters will be sitting in the audience. Those jazz legends will come out and like, hey man, connect. 
you have to see, and partly in watching this movie, you're seeing how people can resist it. The community, and sawmill, and store, carpenter, and the uh, owner. And now, just mostly Japan, the whole country, just the money. <laughs> just the sale, sale. <laughs> That's not any kind of wood. <laughs> If I would not be back here, how many African-American restaurants you see? None. And if I had not stayed here all the time I did, the community would have gone down to nothing, to nothing. You stay in a community, and you build it, and you make it work. I have to do what I have to do. I had to go to that park this morning and cook these 20 gallons of gumbo before I go and serve it out there. And that's the fun thing about today. Look how many people you made happy just with a little cup of gumbo. Why is it that it's something so powerful about eating together? I mean, you know, we could all go and just take a quick hamburger and then talk. Yeah, sure, we could. But there's something about eating together, about experiencing together the, you know, really good taste of this, this meal, the experience of sipping the wine together. But also, it goes deeper than that. I mean, humans need to eat to live. So we are in a collective act, we're sustaining life, our life together. Entonces, de la, decías que de la buena comida sale buen flamenco. Sí, bueno, el, el buen flamenco sale de la no comida. De la no comida. De la no comida. Pero luego cuando hay comida... Pero cuando hay comida es suficiente motivo para hacer una fiesta. ¿Me entiendes? Eso es lo que tienen los gitanos, que no le hace falta mucho dinero para hacer una fiesta. Como se compra un melón y con un melón ya... Hay motivo para hacer una fiesta. Centuries ago, in the deserts of North Africa, people used to gather for these moonlight dances of sacred dance and music that would go on for hours and hours until dawn. And they were always magnificent because the dancers were professionals and they were terrific, right? But every once in a while, very rarely, something would happen and one of these performers would actually become transcendent. And it was like time would stop and the dancer would sort of step through some kind of portal, and he wasn't doing anything different than he had ever done, you know, a thousand nights before, but everything would align, and all of a sudden, he would no longer appear to be merely human. You know, he would be like lit from within and lit from below, and all like lit up on fire with divinity. And when this happened back then, people knew it for what it was, you know, they called it by its name. They would put their hands together, and they would start to chant, Allah, 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 God, 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 that's God, you know? Um, curious historical footnote, um, when the Moors invaded southern Spain, they took this custom with them, and the pronunciation changed over the centuries from Allah, Allah, Allah to Ole, 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 which you still hear in bullfights and in flamenco dances in Spain when a performer has done something impossible and magic. Skillful practices can focus. They can draw things together and become focal practices. It will depend on the particular people there. It'll depend on the particular kind of music and the particular talent of the master musician and the particular instrument and the particular place and time. All of that gets expressed in the music itself. 
And by focusing things, I mean they focus different activities, right? They draw different activities together, different things you could be doing. So again, think about making music. The practice of making music depended on all kinds of other human activities and human practices. You'd have skills for playing the violin, and you'd have skills for creating a hall where music could be played, and you had skills for composing the music, and, and so on. And those all would come together on this moment when the music would be performed. Focal practices would also gather people they'd bring people together to focus on this one event. So the whole community, if they wanted to hear music, would come together and, and they'd uh, be drawn together and, and they'd focus on this moment of great mastery when someone was, again, exhibiting this amazing feature of human life that we can become skillful and disclosive and, and show the world in, in a way that most people aren't capable of doing. <laughs> El flamenco para mí es, para ponerte un ejemplo que esté muy cerca, es como rezar, una forma de, de darle gracias a la vida. Shaving, Freud looks like a god, you know. In the Kamisama made it, God made it, kind of a beautiful word. Make beauty, make more beauty, you know. And uh, God connected me, and the God connected the word, and God connected me. So I try to honor the best give to technique. Para mí, Dios no está ni en Roma, ni en la iglesia, ni muchísimo menos. Dios está en las cosas sencillas y en las difíciles sencilleces. And this is the way I would like everybody to come to the table, sometimes at their houses. Sit your people down to the table if they're gonna eat just ramen noodles. Sit them there and let them eat it and enjoy it. And you enjoy talking to one another and enjoy life, you know that. When we finally understand mastery and a responsiveness to the richness and the calling in the world, then we understand that the source of meaning in our lives isn't in us, that's the Cartesian tradition, and it isn't in some supreme being, but it's in our way of being in the world. Being in the world is a unified phenomenon. When people are at their best and most absorbed in doing a skillful thing, they lose themselves into their absorption, and the distinction between the master and the world disappears. Seeing what masters can do, and seeing that we can do it too, that everybody can, in their way, bring out what's best in themselves and in the world, that we can re-experience what people called the sacred. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh.